So this evening we're on a holy Zoom meeting and Zoom sometimes has a whole load of advantages for us. And one of them is to be able to connect with speakers that we wouldn't usually be able to hear from. And tonight is one such instance because we're heading off to the other side of the world for our speaker this evening, Professor Graham Tulloch, who will be um, speaking on um, James Hogg. Um, you'll be aware I've sent around some information um, about tonight's speaker. He's an emeritus, emeritus professor of English, of English at Flinders University in Adelaide, South Australia. And he taught there for 40 years before retiring in 2013. His first book was The Language of Walter Scott, a study of his Scottish and period language that was published in 1980. And he's um, had other writing on the Scots language, and that includes a second book on the history of the Scots Bible with, with selected texts in 1989, and a substantial chapter on the Lexis of Scots since 1700 in the Edinburgh History of the Scots Language, and that was edited by Charles. Jones in 1997. So as an Australian, he's lived for most of his life in Adelaide, and he's also got a particular interest in the Scots language and Scottish literature in Australia. And since the publication in 1998 of his edition of Walter Scott's Ivanhoe in the Edinburgh edition of the Waverley no novels, he's edited a number of Scottish and Australian texts, including with Judy King, Scott's shorter fiction and also James Hogg's The Three Perils of Man and he's also made contributions to Scottish periodicals in the Stirling South, Carol South Carolina research edition of the collected works of James Hogg and that's with Judy King and J.H. Alexander Scott's The Siege of Malta and Bizarro. So tonight our speaker will be speaking speaking on making a name for himself, James Hogg and Scottish newspapers and magazines. And I'd very like, much like to warm um, Graham this evening and from very sunnier and warmer climes than what we have at the minute. So Graham, over to you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Heather. Okay. Um, I'd like to begin by um, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right. OK, sorry. OK, uh, before I start, I would like to uh, acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Ghana people, who are the original inhabitants of the Adelaide Plains and the Adelaide Hills. And uh, as is traditional in Australia now, I honour their elders at past and present. I'd also make, like to make two other acknowledgements. First of all, to Judy King. We worked together on our volume, Hogg's Contributions to Scottish Periodicals. And uh, I owe a lot to her, um, the work that we did together. And we could not have done our work without uh, the work, previous work of Gillian Hughes. So to begin, making a name for himself is something that preoccupies Hogg throughout his working life. Or perhaps I should say making names for himself. Uh, since it was not just one name or identity that he tried to establish for himself, but many. Now, there is a bibliographical element to this and also a biographical one, and I want to talk about both of these. The earliest, best known and longest lasting of these identities is the Ettrick Shepherd, but there are several others. None of these have the same consistent formulation as the Ettrick Shepherd, and the names I will use here are not his own. They include Burns' successor, champion of border sports, and, and major Scottish poet, or even major, major British poet. I'll discuss all of these. These identities 
uh, the biographical element of my talk. Of course, many of Hogg's literary works supported one or more of these identities. They did this either directly by claiming the identity, as when songs and stories are published under the name The Ettrick Shepherd, a practice culminating in his collection Songs by the Ettrick Shepherd, or by demonstrating his right to the identity through what he wrote. But today I want to explore specifically the ways in which Hogg used Scottish magazines, particularly, particularly Whitley magazines, and newspapers to promote these various identities. And this is where we run up against the biographical element. What I particularly want to look at are some rather humdrum pieces, such as short reports in newspapers and magazines, most of which are anonymous or pseudonymous. This is where we move into more problematic territory. There is no doubt that Hogg did write anonymously and pseudonymously for newspapers and magazines. We have documentary evidence for this. For example, an anonymous report on the Carter Hall cattle show in the Kelso Mail in October 1816 must be by Hogg, as we have a draft of it in his hand. We also have evidence for pseudonymous material. For instance, a letter to Charles Kirkpatrick's, Kirkpatrick Sharp Esquire on his original mode of editing church history was published in Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine in December, 1817. It was published up over the unhelpful initials MM, but, Sir, but Hogg is confirmed as its author by the publisher's records. Beyond such cases, however, certainty ends and questions begin. On the face of it, we would hardly expect that Hogg's contribution to newspapers and magazines would be limited to the cases where the original manuscripts or, sub manuscripts or submission letters for, for some reason happened to have survived. But how do we identify other items? I want to warn you that I'm going out on a limb here. The evidence is often quite scanty. And while I think it is sufficient, you might not think so. So let's see how we go. You might well ask why I'm venturing into this bibliographical, bibliographically problematic area at all. After all, there is plenty of other material by Hogg. Well, to make my argument here, I need to consider more than the isolated proven cases. I need to move beyond the certain to the probable and perhaps sometimes to the possible. If I do this, new opportunities open up. In particular, it's possible to trace lines of campaign by Hogg in newspapers and magazines to establish one or other of these names or identities. First, however, I need to address a bigger question. Why was Hogg so keen to establish these names, these identities for himself? There's nothing new about the answer I will give. It is social and literary insecurity, as many people have pointed out. Hogg did not come from the same social class as his compeers on the literary scene, nor did he have the same educational background. At an early stage, after only a short period of edu education in the local school, he was forced to leave home to take work as a farm servant, rising from the lowliest of the low, a cow mind, to the much more respected role of shepherd. Along the way, he completed his education as an autodidact and began to write poetry. This was one side of his education. Equally important was his childhood in a household rich in traditional folklore, including stories of the supernatural, as well as deep knowledge of the Bible and the theology of the Kurt. This was not the path to literature taken by his contemporaries like Walter Scott, John Wilson, and J.G. Lockhart, who had progressed through school to university. In the case of Wilson and Lockhart, that has included Oxford, before they began to appear as authors on the literary scene. In this context, the identity of the Ettrick Shepherd 
which Hogg had cre created for and adopted was a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it expressed his legitimacy as a writer about rural Scotland, sheep farming, and folk tales and beliefs. On the other hand, it offered his associates in the literary scene the chance to describe him as a mere shepherd from a literary backwater. Knowledgeable about country life, but somewhat unsophisticated about city life, city life and literature. In particular, it allowed Wilson to confine him to the narrow role of shepherd when he introduced a fictionalized version of Hogg in his widely read Nocte's Ambrosiana. This was, as you no doubt know, a series of accounts of drinking session in Ambrose's tavern that appeared regularly in Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine. Wilson makes Hogg one of the main participants in these sessions, but keeps him firmly in place by heading his speeches with the, with the name Shepherd. By contrast, Wilson gives himself the much more majestic sounding name, Christopher North. Uh, I'll just try and share my screen with you. Uh, okay, the host has disabled that. That's fine. Um, I have to do without the, uh, the screen. You should be able to do it now. Okay, thank you. So here's just an extract from the um, uh, from uh, the Noctes Ambrosiana, and you can see uh, North is speaking in English, and Shepherd, the Shepherd, um, Hog is speaking in Scots, and offering a rather unsophisticated um, comment. Hog security in his role, um, Hog's insecurity in his role, I should say, continued throughout his life. Looking back to earlier times towards the end of his life, he claims that at, this, at that period, the whole of the aristocracy and literature of our country was set against me and determined to keep me down, nay, to crush me to a non-entity. Thanks be to God, I have lived to see the sentiments of my countrymen completely changed. The very vehemence with which he asserts this suggests to me a lingering anxiety. It was against this background that Hogg continually strove to assert his right to be considered a major writer and a commentator on a wide range of issues not confined to rural Scotland, sheep farming and folklore. This endeavour was spread over many different kinds of writing, but there was a special advantage in the anonymity of newspapers and sometimes magazines. Whereas he could directly assert his identity in writings to which he put his own name or the sobriquet, the Ettrick Shepherd, this could be dismissed as mere self-promotion. Assertions of identity would be more telling if they apparently came from someone else's pen. It's Hogg cre Hogg's creation and exploitation of this advantageous position of appearing to be someone else that has led me to look specifically at um, Sorry, that has led me to look specifically at newspapers and magazines. I want to concentrate here on two areas of identity that were particularly important to Hogg. I'll start with the Ettrick Shepherd identity, which is closely tied to the patron of Border Games identity, and then deal with the leading poet of his time, major British poet, major Scottish poet, identity, which is strongly it tied in with the Burns successive identity. Along the way, I'll mention a couple of other identities. From this will emerge some common threads of the different strategies he employed in pursuit of making a name for himself. 
The Ettrick Shepherd identity was first created in a magazine, the long-standing and venerable Scots magazine. This goes back to the beginning of Scott's career, Hogg's career, when the Scots magazine provided his first outlet for publication. As Gillian Hughes has written, the Scots magazine provided writers, particularly those of relatively modest social backgrounds, with an outlet. So it provided an ideal medium for developing an identity based on Hogg's status as a working man, a shepherd. His earliest publications are anonymous, but from 1803, he starts signing his work as, first of all, a Scots shepherd or a shepherd writing from Ettrick, then it moves quickly to James Hogg writing from Ettrick Banks, until finally he appears as James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, in May 1804. And this is a uh, picture of the very first appearance, as far as I can tell, of the combined by James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd. Hi, Graham. We can't actually see your screen. If you want to try sharing again, that would be fab. Okay, I'll go back. Now, can you see it? No, unfortunately not. Uh, okay, I'll have to do without that then. Sorry um, about that. Okay, you can see me okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, right, where was I? So we, uh, we get the appearance of the um, attribution to James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, and then we get um, uh, 14 months later, we find an article in the Scots magazine entitled Further Particulars of the Life of James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, under the pseudonym Z. This is where we move from bibliographical certainty to probability. Zed knows an awful lot about Hogg's early life, and I'm not the first to suggest that Zed is actually James Hogg. Indeed, I think most Hogg scholars would take that view. If it is Hogg's work, and I believe it is, then this is an early case of one of his favorite ploys in promoting identity for himself, making the information appear to come from someone else. It seems that having finally chosen what was to be his favorite sobriquet of the, the Ettrick Shepherd, he's determined to cement this identity in place by having Zed endorse it. By 1807, we find the words by James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, on the title page of his collection, The Mountain Bard. In 1810, when he publishes his poem, The Dawn of July, in the Edinburgh Evening Courant, it is given as for the Courant by the Ettrick Shepherd. Thereafter, the attribution, the Ettrick Shepherd, regularly appears at the head of his contributions to Scottish newspapers and magazines, with or without his actual name. Towards the end of his life, when he was writing the Chambers Edinburgh Journal, every single contribution is by the Ettrick Shepherd, except one called Adventure of the Ettrick Shepherd, but even that is given as by himself. You might think that with this constant iteration of by the Ettrick Shepherd, Hogg did not really have any very great need to foster and promote this identity. However, once Wilson had co-opted this identity for the Noctis and created his own shepherd, Hogg was in danger of losing control of this identity, which was so central to his literary standing. One way to win back control was through comedy. In Dr. David Dale's account of a grand aerial, aerial voyage, Hogg paradoxically resumes control of his identity by having David Dale completely misrepresent, misrepresent the identity of the Ettrick Shepherd. First of all, Dale comprehensively fails to recognize the name James Hogg as Hogg, as narrator tells us. 
It so happened that in an exceedingly short space, he asked me my name more than a dozen times, forgetting it always the next minute. Then when Dale is prompted by the question, if he had ever heard of an odd fellow styled the Ettrick Shepherd, he exclaims, the Ettrick Shepherd, well may I remember him and well may he remember me, which he will do the longest day he has to live. I wonder if the old cock be still alive, for if he be, he must be a very old man. When told the Ettrick Shepherd is known as a poet, he exclaims again, as, for his, as to poetry, God mend it. If telling the most extravagant lies be poetry, we have a grand set of poets nowadays. But I think of them all, there was never any told so many confounded lies as that jock hog. Now, remember this is a story whose de title declares it to be by the Edinburgh Shepherd. All of this only works because we know that the Ettrick Shepherd is not a man so old that he might be dead, and that his name is James Hogg, not Jock Hogg. All this distortion, distortion and confusion serves only to reinforce the reader's understanding that the real Ettrick Shepherd is the real James Hogg. So far, I've talked about Hogg's overt positioning of himself as the Ettrick Shepherd, but I want now to turn to covert positioning through anonymous material. But first I need to explore some of the implications of this particular non moniker that Hogg clung to so tenaciously. Ettrick is, or was, as I'm sure you know, a parish in Selkirkshire extending for some miles along Ettrick Water. Hogg was born in this valley and spent his first years there. Ettrick had a reputation for place where stories of the supernatural, and particularly of the fairies, had lingered longer than anywhere else. Hogg fostered this reputation through the story of his grandfather, Willard Fall, who lived in the upper part of Ettrickdale and was, according to Hogg, the last man of this wild region who heard, saw, and conversed with the fairies. In passing, I note that his association with fairies through his grandfather greatly enhanced claim, Hogg's claim status as an authority on the supernatural and fairy law, another of the identities he wished to adopt, though I won't be talking about it today. Anyway, at this time he began to at the time he began to identify himself as a shepherd from Ettrick in 1803. Hogg had returned to Ettrick Vale to look after his parents. But even by the time he first appeared in the Scots magazine as the Ettrick Separate, he had moved on from Ettrick. When finally he returned to live in Selkirkshire, it was to Yarrowdale, not Ettrickdale, and he stayed in Yarrowdale until his death. Originally, the word Ettrick referred to Ettrickdale as when he signs himself as from Ettrick Banks. But after the move to Yarrowdale, he could still use the word Ettrick, since the whole area, including both Ettrick and Yarrow parishes, was known as Ettrick Forest. Still, he needed something to tie him firmly to the area and continue to qualify him as the Ettrick Shepherd, although by now he was a sheep farmer rather than a shepherd. One way he could associate himself with the area was through sponsoring border games at his farm Mount Benger, and later also in a separate set of games at Inner Lethen. To, to broadcast this association with the games to the world, he chose the newspapers. This is where we enter onto a major bibliographical question. In March 1831, an account of the border games at Mount Benger appeared in the Edinburgh Evening Winter Weekly Chronicle. It's marked as from a correspondent, and it must be the account that Hogg sent to his friend John Aiken when asking him to forward it to the Chronicle. Unfortunately, in this case, we don't have a manuscript for this piece, and it is obviously possible that Hogg was forwarding somebody else's account. However, this seems pretty unlikely, given that the report concludes with these words, these are the original border games of the South, 
and had been kept alive by Mr. Hogg's exertions alone in Ettrick and Yarrow for a space of nearly 40 years. The club has no member but himself. If Hogg is the only member, who other than him could have supplied the information? It will be seen that the sentences give Hogg all the credit for the long-standing games, but they also make clear that the games are primarily associated with Ettrick and Yarrow, despite the broader title of Border Games. Further reading the report reveals that the big event was two rounds of a football match between the men of Yarrow and lads of Ettrick. The match begins when the Ettrick Shepherd throws up a ball. The report then firmly associates Hogg with Ettrick and also with Yarrow. Um, just to throw in a comment, uh, uh, Wordsworth in his rather lovely poem, um, Yarrow Visit, Revisited, um, uh, associates uh, Hog with Yarrow, not particularly with Ettrick. This poem, however, this report on the um, games in the um, Edinburgh Evening Book Weekly Chronicle is a is part of a whole series of very similar reports on the Harrodale, Yarrowdale games, extending from 1825 to 1831 when they came to an end and on the Inner Lethem Games from 1827 until 1835, the year of Hogg's death. Reports on the Inner Lethem Games actually continue after 1835, but they're written in a quite different style, which leads us to the bibliographical question, did Hogg write all the reports up to 1835? There cannot be any definitive answer to this without external evidence, but there is strong internal evidence that Hogg wrote at least some of them. I should say, I'm not the first to suggest this. The suggestion is also made by David Groves in his book, James Hogg and the Saronan Spawner Cup. These reports are usually quite straightforward, naming the winners of the various gymnastic contests, often with a longer account of the ball games at the end, and usually printed in more than one Edinburgh newspaper. However, in the 1829 articles, there's a notable departure from this bare bones account. When it comes to John, uh, to George and John Laidlaw, winners of foot races at Mount Benjamin, we are told that these two young men are brothers, great grandsons to the far famed Will of Four. And when Robert and George Wade Laidlaw win races, win races at Inner they described it as brothers and great grandsons of the celebrated Lillifor, the swiftest running, the swiftest runner this county ever knew. Also in the report of the Inner Games for 1835, the last that Hogg attended, Robert Laidlaw, winner of the steeplechase, is described as a descendant of old Willowfall, so long celebrated in the racing calendar of uh, Ettrick Forest. What prompted these highly unusual pieces of extra information? Well, had Hogg had a intense interest in Willowfall, alias William Laidlaw of Thorhaw, his own grandfather. What's more, when Hogg had a gravestone erected in Ettrick Kirkyard, Kirkyard memorialising his grandfather. The words he chose for it are, the far famed will of Ford, who for freaks of frolic, agility and strength had no equal in his day. The similarity of wording on the gravestone, particularly the, the words far famed will of Ford, uh, strongly, this similarity strongly suggests that the two reports are by Scott Hogg. But all the reports are in a very similar style. If Hogg wrote the reports mentioning his grandfather, it seems reasonable to assume he wrote the others, which are so stylistically similar. All the accounts of the Yarrow Games mention that they took place at Mount Benjamin. Although Hogg is not named as the farmer at Mount Benjamin, it was well known as his farm, 
not least from the regular references to it by the shepherd in Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine in the Not Days Ambrosiana. My personal belief is that Hogg wrote all these pieces and that here we can see him using the humble expedient of newspapers to promote anonymously his championing of border sports and perhaps even more important to reinforce the continuing connection of James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, with Ettrick and Yarrow. There's another great advantage in, of this association with the border games. Lockhart described the Shepherd of Wilson's Noctes Ambrosiana, as opposed to the real Hogg, as a boozing buffoon. While this is an oversimplification, the Noctes consistently portray the Shepherd engaged in drinking parties engendering a kind of representation of him as a boozing buffoon. By contrast, the games were ex exhibitions of healthy outdoor activities like foot races, putting shot, playing football, wrestling and hammer throwing. The whole ambience of these occasions presided over by Hogg is the complete opposite to the, to the drunken revelry of Ambrose's tavern. To use a modern phrase, what we have here is the healthy alternative to the shepherd of Wilson's Noctes Ambrosiana. I'll just try and turn, turn off my noise. Finally, I want to turn to an identity or rather two closely related identities which Hogg held particularly close to his heart, that of being um, one of the major Scottish poets of his time and specifically Burns' successor. Once again, I believe he used newspapers and magazines to promote anonymously these two identities. By the end of his life, Hogg apparently believed that he'd been born on the 25th of January, 1772, the anniversary of Burns' birthday. Although the Ettrick Parish records show he was baptized 14 months earlier on the 30th of November, 1770. I don't think we know when this idea first came into his mind, but he'd certainly long hoped to become the Burns of his age and sharing a birthday with him was a way of symbolizing that he was the reborn Burns. What may have been an early shot in his campaign to identify himself with Burns occurs in newspaper accounts of a celebration of Burns' birthday on the 25th of January, 1815. Hogg himself had initiated the idea of this celebration and organized it. It's hard to think of anybody else who could have provided the detailed information contained in the newspaper reports. The reports describe two significant moments in which Hogg is symbolically associated with Burns. First comes a list of the toasts offered at the celebration. Hogg appears in a list of major contemporary poets, Gam Campbell, Scott, Byron and Suddy, and the proposed and the toasts they propose. The wording of Hogg's toast is, is the toast offered by Hogg is significant. May there never be a wanting a ploughman or a shepherd to perpetuate and increase the honours of our country. Ploughman or shepherd, Burns or Hogg. Hogg is the new Burns, both of them farm workers and poets. Secondly, we're told that at a late hour, Burns' well-known marble bowl was introduced and placed with poetic propriety before Mr. Hogg, who filled and refilled it with the author's favourite liquor, whiskey punch. Following this account, four of the songs written or adapted for the occasion appeared a few days later in the newspapers. The first of these songs is by Hogg, and the second was adopted by him, adapted by him from a Burns poem. We're explicitly told this, and again, it seems highly likely that Hogg was the source of this information. And whether or not Hogg was the author of these reports, we find him placed as an equal with some of the leading poets of the time, 
And we also find him placed literally and symbolically as Byrne's successor on an occasion when, which he had himself organized. Now you can see that I'm just speculating here. I don't have any controversial, incontrovertible evidence of Hogg's authorship. But if I look at it as part of a broad pattern, I can see that it fits. The problem is that Hogg is such a lively and imaginative writer, always bringing surprises on us, that it's hard for us to think of him as the writer of such mundane material. But if we put together proven cases and possible cases, I think we can see a pattern emerging. And he had a motive. We know he wanted to promote certain identities for himself, and these humble pieces of work could help him do that. Well, whatever you might think about who wrote these Burns pieces, there's a rather stronger evidence of his authorship in reports of the Shakespeare anniversary celebration in the April of the same year, 1815. Alexander Bald had organized a Shakespeare club in Allo, which every year celebrated Shakespeare's birthday. Hogg regularly joined the celebrations. He couldn't attend in 1815, so he sent Bald his Ode to the Genius of Shakespeare to be read on the occasion. And he asked Bald to send him an account of the proceedings for submission to the newspapers. Shortly afterwards, accounts of this event, including the Ode, appeared in both the Caledonian Mercury and the Edinburgh Evening Courant. They differ slightly from each other, and one is as is presented as a letter signed AB, which happens to be Alexander Bald's initials, but also looks like a pseudonym, while the other is set out as a report. There seem to be two main purposes to these accounts, to provide the text of Hogg's Ode and to list the major Scottish poets of the day, including Hogg. The argument is a little complex, and, and I've set it out in the journal of the James Hogg Society, but I believe this is another case of Hogg anonymously promoting his place as one of the leading Scottish poets of recent decades. There he is, listed beside Byron, Burns, Campbell, Scott, and Wilson, along with a number of their now forgotten contemporaries. Given that this forefronting of Hogg seems to be the purpose of the piece, it's interesting that the Courant's account begins by referring to a long letter from a correspondent, which for want of room, we are obliged to abridge. There's no such comment in the Caledonian Mercury's version, and it looks very like the longer version is a fiction, and the only text that ever existed was the bit concerning Hogg. If this is written by Hogg, as I believe is the case, He's once again engineered a situation where it appears some anonymous or pseudonymous person has endorsed his position as a major Scottish poet, when actually it is, he is doing it himself. Implicitly, too, he's aligning himself with Shakespeare. However, for acknowledgement that the Ode to the Genius of Shakespeare was his work, he had to wait until the account of the following year's celebration, where he read it to the club members. On that occasion, he was presented with a silver cup with the inscription presented to Mr. James Hogg by his brethren of the Shakespeare Club of Alloa in testimony of their esteem of him, of him as a man and their admiration of him as a poet. This gift must have greatly helped given his keenness to receive recognition as a poet. Once again, this anonymous account of this second event with its strong endorsement of his stature as a poet could very possibly have been written by Hogg. Certainly he wrote the account of the club's activities for the following year, 1817, a large part of which features a parody of Southey, which he had written for a board to recite. Finally, in 1819, an account of that year's celebration appeared in the Edinburgh magazine under the title, Alloa Speeches. Maybe I'm becoming a bit too suspicious, but it st strikes me that each of the chosen speeches reported on promotes a hog poem. His ballad, The Mermaid, in the first, uh, and the passage from one, one of the passages from his poetic mirror imitations in the second. 
is this yet another case of Hogg using an anonymous report to bring his own poetic talents to the fore? Interestingly, the report begins with this passage. We have received a long, long detail of the proceedings of the Shakespeare Club of Alloa from one of our correspondents, containing all the speeches, toasts and songs given at their last annual meeting. But the toasts given at the literary meeting are now so obvious that everyone knows by anticipation what they are, and to publish them would only be, by make, only be making out a muster roll of names that are published twice or thrice every year. Was there really a longer account, or is this just an excuse on Hogg's part for concentrating on the speeches that brought him to the fore? Significantly, I feel, we seem to have a repeat of the 1815 report, where we were, told, we were also told that there was a longer account from which this material about Hogg is excerpted, from which this material about Hogg is excerpted. I don't think there was ever a longer account on either occasion, but Clark Hogg has cleverly managed to present himself as the most important and interesting thing excerpted from that long non-existent longer account. Another interesting aspect of this introductory comment about the supposed long, longer letter is Hogg's rejection of the list of topics of, of toasts, arguing that to publish them would only be by making out a muster roll of names that are published twice or thrice every year. Of course, he's repudiating the very tactic used a few months earlier. Maybe he thought it unwise to use the tactic too often, or perhaps he thought the very absence of the list would inspire people to make up their own list of major poets, including him, of course. And I should say that this um, putting his own poetry into reports uh, is something that goes back a long way. Um, the, the only second appearance of the, we found of Hogg's work in a Scottish newspaper in the Caledonian Mercury in June 1811, contains an eight line article on fundraising for the debating society, the forum, followed by 26 lines of Hogg's verse. The, the report is given that this is an excuse to put some of Hogg's verse into it. Now for one final campaign to promote himself as a major poet. It's carried out between May 1829 and May 1831 in the Edinburgh Literary Journal, a weekly to which Hogg contributed some 40 pieces over three years. Incidentally, the journal published a portrait of Hogg, which he very much liked, and which is very different from the images of the boozing buffoon produced by the Liza brothers. The campaign begins in May 1829 with a poem by Hogg containing a passing reference to poetry, which is, quotes, from doggerel to the true sublime, from David Tweedy to Lord Byron. Then three months later, we have a piece of truly doggerel verse called The Bards of Britain, ascribed to this same David Tweedy. This is followed up two weeks later by an anonymous review of a novel called The Davenants, um, a camp or a campaign of fashion in Dublin, which opens with these um, scathing words. This is a vulgar piece of fashionable drivel, peculiarly offensive to our nostrils. It is a matter of 600 pages covered with letterpress, but for what earthly purpose? For, but for what earthly purpose, it goes beyond the length, length of, my, of our tether, as David Tweedy says, to discover. For what earthly purpose, it goes beyond the length of our tether, as David Tweedy says, to discover. There's no further mention of David Tweedy for, an, for eight months until April 1830, when we find him signing a poem in blank verse entitled Lines for the Eye of Mr. James Hogg, sometimes termed the Ettrick Shepherd, in which he reproaches Hogg for having put words into his mouth in the parts of Britain. Finally, a month later, we find verses for, for the eye of Mr. David Tweedy of that ilk by the Ettrick Shepherd, in which Hogg calls him um, 
an old catawoody cankered owl and claims that Tweedy composed the lines of the Bards of Britain when drunk with brandy and quite forgot them and then asserted like a randy, he never wrote them. As the correspondence goes on, it becomes increasingly clear that all this comes from the hand of Hogg himself. No doubt he had great fun conducting, concocting this spurious poetic correspondence, but it also had a serious underlying purpose. The first Tweedy poem, The Bards of Britain, goes through all the most prominent poets of the age, including Hogg himself, offering comic summaries of their achievement. Starting with Brian and Suddy, then Wordsworth, Wilson, Hogg, Cunningham and more, it moves on to some other lesser poets before ending with three prominent women, Felicia Hemans, Letitia Elizabeth Landon and Joanna Bailey. Hogg appears amongst them all. This, I think, is the last time Hogg appears in a list of major poets that he has created himself. It begins under a pseudonym, but it makes no great effort to pursue. But the poem makes no great effort, that the campaign makes no great effort to preserve the fictitious David, um, David Tweedy. As always, Hogg likes to pretend that someone else is including him in the list. But in the end, since almost all of the others are treated to the same kind of comical criticism as he is, he can afford to more or less admit that he's the author of it all. It's a last brave attempt to place himself in the pantheon of contemporary British poets. I want to end with a coda to look at the question, how effective was Hogg's, were Hogg's efforts? I think we can say that they were effective at till, until at least the end of the century. In 1898, a memorial to Hogg was unveiled in Ettrickdale near his birthplace. A little more memorial volume was produced for the occasion, recording the speeches given by various dignitaries. We see that the moniker, the Ettrick Shepherd, is alive and well. One speaker quite explicitly offers the line offered by Hogg, saying that Hogg rose to a very high position among the foremost literary mention of his age, men of his age, and as a poet, he secured a place second only to Burns himself. So he's both an important poet and he's second only to Burns himself. The same speaker offers the backhanded comment that the Queen's Wake is the high water mark of his genius. He never wrote anything better than this. He never wrote anything so good as Kilmeny. Kilmeny being, of course, the most famous poem from the Queen's Wake, as Miss Jean Brady knew when she talked of it to her girls. Jean Brady's comment in her 1930s prime reminds us that the notion of Hogg as principally a poet survived well into the 20th century. However, attitudes have changed. One reason is that Wilson's knock days, so famous in the 19th century, are now virtually unread. A pity as they are lively and entertaining. So Hogg's efforts to burnish his Ettrick Shepherd identity are no longer needed to counteract Wilson's picture of the shepherd. We now give much more attention to his one perfect poem, The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justice by Sinner, as well as his many fine short stories and other pieces of fiction. After a period of neglect, we have returned to the poetry, recognising anew what an achievement the Queen's Wake was, but also appreciating just how diverse and innovative Hogg's poetry is, and his prose too. We're no longer bothered by his frankness about sexuality, including his acceptance of premarital sex, his portrayal of extreme violence in books like The Three Perils of Man, his sudden swapping from one genre to another within the same work, his ironic undercutting of himself, his fantastic fat tales of magic and cross-species relationships. None of this bothers us. And I must say, this is all to the good. There is so much more to enjoy in this endlessly inventive and imaginative writer than could be encompassed by the lame names, Ettrick Shepherd and the New Burns. The biggest irony perhaps is that for all his efforts to secure his position in the poetic pantheon of his day, 
It is as a novelist rather than as a poet that he's best known today. Even the Ettrick Shepherd identity has been largely replaced by his own original identity of James Hogg. Hogg put a lot of energy into covert and overt endeavours to establish the identities he wanted for himself. But in the long term, he failed to define his entity, identity for us. We now see Hogg's identity through his own eyes, through our own eyes rather than through his. To conclude, for all my enthusiasm for trying to identify some possible anonymous writing as Hogg's, it's probably no great pity that his newspaper writings have been largely forgotten. They might add something to his bibliography, and they might add a few nuances to his biography, but they're not central to his literary reputation. Still, if I'm right in identifying these pieces as Hogg's, it is, I think, instructive to recognise the effort he put into these mundane and ephemeral writings, and to consider the reasons why he might have taken the trouble to write them in the first place. Thank you. Graeme, thank you very much for that uh, very illuminating um, paper uh, about um, Hogg's um, changing identity through his names. I'm sure the other members would, um, would like to um, thank you um, as well. And if anyone has any questions for Graeme, please put it in the chat box and, and we'll, we'll fire away at them. So we do have one at the minute and hopefully I can um, um, read them out. So we've got one from, I think, Robert Laurie. Has no one applied to hog the sort of mathematical textual analysis, at least for longer pieces, which Gary Taylor uses to find new Shakespeare plays and which Sir Brian Vickers shoots down in the Times Literary Supplement. Okay, I'm not aware of any such um, as such work. Um, and uh, I think it would be interesting to do it. Uh, but, and, and uh, there, you know, people who've done that sort of thing seem to be able to apply it to a variety of different texts by the same author. Um, you know, a variety of different genres of texts. But at the same time, these pieces are so very mundane and straightforward and so on. They really don't seem to have the typical characteristics of uh, Hogg, the sort of things we would expect to have from Hogg. Um, and so I don't know whether uh, such um, mathematical analysis would actually uh, produce any results. Um, but it's an interesting, it's an inter interesting question. Okay, thank you. Um... We've got one here from Graeme Lyle saying thank you. How does his reputation rank these days and has his self-promotion been eventually a negative factor, if unearthed? Uh, I don't think his self-promotion has been ultimately a negative factor. Um, it's it's really part of his personality. You, um, if you want to if you want to read Hogg, then you have to accept the, the man as a whole. Um, and um, he's not not necessarily um, modest about himself. And he talks about himself quite a lot, um, and that's that's part of the whole picture you get of him. Um, but I think also the, the self-promotion, as I'm suggesting here, a lot of the self-promotion ended up being um, fruitless, really. Um, his attempt to, to promote himself as a major poet of the time uh, is not really been successful. Um, I think his his poetic reputation has risen a bit in in recent years, um, 
particularly because of the uh, Sterling South Carolina edition of his works. Um, but uh, he, um, um, he I, I still don't think he's considered to be one of the most important poets of the time, but perhaps that's perhaps that's a bit unfair. It is it is it is difficult because um, the the justified sinner has so completely overshadowed his whole uh, reputation. Uh, it's so much the best known work of his, and it is such a brilliant piece of work. Um, I would say unflawed, unlike almost every other piece of work he wrote, um, that it's hard to, to think of him as a poet. And perhaps perhaps I sh shouldn't be so negative. Um, did, uh, after all, Scott is getting a lot more attention as a poet at the time. Um, and maybe Hogg should be getting it as well. Okay, do we have any more um, questions? I would like to make um, a comment. It strikes me that um, that Hogg was making a huge transformation between um, at, the, at the start of his career being um, associating him with the Ettrick Shepherd to what he was doing for his self-promotion as one of the great poets um, towards the end of his career. And I'm aware that some of the agricultural writers of the late 18th century, early 19th century, were also going off and some of them were, were using different ways to chart them, chart their names through their careers. Are you aware of any differences in Hogg in the way that he's writing, say, for the, for, on agricultural topics as how he's writing for, say, other types of material? Um. I think uh, it's a, it's one of these identities that I didn't talk about it much, although um, the Ettrick, it's interesting, the Ettrick Shepherd identity really is a literary identity, and we associate the Ettrick Shepherd with his literary works. But of course, he did write quite a lot about sheep farm uh, and other agricultural topics. Um, and um, uh, what, what I can say, is that uh, there is a copy of his uh, book on sheep diseases in the Australian National Library. And that copy belonged to the, um, uh, the original, or in it, there is a little manuscript that says that it was used by the original sheep farmer, the first farmer who brought the merino sheep to Australia. Now the merino sheep is the you know overwhelmingly the the sheep of Australia, and um, uh, he was he was certainly known as a writer about sheep farming um, in Australia, and sheep farming was incredibly important to Australia. Of course, it was a completely different kind of sheep farming, um, but um, there were shepherds in Australia originally, um, living in isolated lives. Um, so I think uh, that reputation continued. Um, of course, the other thing it, about his reputation um, is that uh, Wilson's picture of him in the Notpes Ambrosiana um, is as well known as any of his own writing, perhaps better known in some cases. Um, and you, you have done quite a lot of work on appearances of Hogg in, in Australian newspapers. And you'll find that um, it, you'll get quotations and will say, as the Ettrick Shepherd says, or as Hogg says. And what is actually being quoted is Wilson, not, not, um, not Hogg himself. Um, so there were all sorts of rep reputations, I think, for Hogg floating around. Um, and of course, you know, it's interesting that Kilmini is the, is the poem that is um, chosen uh, for particular praise, um, including by Jean Brody. Um, and I presume that that is actually a miracle, um, spark remembering her, her childhood education um, uh, because it's the pure poem. Um, you don't have the, the sexuality, free sexuality that you get in, 
in other works. Um, and I think that was sort of hidden away to some extent through the 19th century. Um, and uh, it's come back into much more focus in the 20th century. So that aspect of him, yeah. Th thank you very much. Are there any last questions? Heather, I don't know whether I could just try and try again to see if I can share my screen. Okay. Are you seeing my screen now? No, we're not. Um, okay. All right. Well, I'll have to give up on that. Um, I had a few pictures, but they're not particularly. Uh, important or illuminating. Okay, C can I um, ask everyone to, um, in their usual manner, to say thank thank you very much um, to Graham and for coming to us from the other from the other side of the world. And um, it's absolutely been absolute. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you um, he here. And yes, we're we're, get we're getting the thank yous um, in the in the chat as well. So just to say a huge thank you from us at the Edinburgh Bibliographical Society. And very quickly, for members, our next meeting will be on the sixteenth of February, and we'll be in at an in person meet meeting in the Quaker Meeting House at our usual time, and we will have Professor Andrew Pettigree and Arthur De Der when on the library a fragile history so just to say thank you thank you very much everyone for coming and lastly thank you very much to um graham for his very stimulating pre presentation tonight thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to talk to you and talk about this material which i've been working on recently uh, it's been a real pleasure even though i had to get up at four o'clock and four thirty in the morning um it's been nice to talk to everybody Thank and to recognise some names amongst the names there. Thank you. Yes, and enjoy enjoy your enjoy your day. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.